Uh, this is uh, Windsor Castle, not, not a million miles from Kew, but uh, a, a completely different problem, completely different kind of building and a different set of responsibilities and a different sort of approach to uh, how one addresses uh, 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 damage in a building and this time fire damage. Uh, Donald and Associates were responsible as the, uh, as the uh, coordinating architects for all of the uh, projects at Kew after... The first phase of work, which took the first year from the 20th of November 1992 till more or less a year later, 1993, uh, during which time uh, uh, Stephen Batchelor was responsible for the works, and uh, during which time uh, temporary roofs and then permanent roofs were put over a large part of the, uh, uh, the area. Uh, the work was completed some five years later, on the 20th of November 1997. And so, I mean, in some ways, this is an even older project than the one that Julian was talking about earlier. Uh, I'm going to look at uh, different aspects of the project. I'm going to look at how the fire started and spread, how it was fought and the aftermath, the decision-making process, uh, why were the rooms generally restored, uh, some of what we discovered, the philosophy of equivalent restoration and how that was applied, and the restoration of state rooms, uh, what the issues were and the approaches. My, my part in all of this was, uh, I, got, I, got, I got dealt the best hand actually on this project because I got to do all the swanky bits. I got to do the state rooms and I got to do the sort of the, adjacent, the rooms adjacent to the state rooms other than St. George's Hall and the chapel, which were done by Siddle Gibson, Giles, uh, Giles uh, Downs, of course. And uh, colleagues uh, also did the dining rooms. Anyway, overall, uh, we're, going to, we're going to have a look overall at the work at Windsor, but I'll probably concentrate mainly on what, uh, what my role was and the things that I was actually responsible for. Just so that we're all aware of where we are at Windsor, uh, uh, yeah. this is Windsor Castle North, the M4 and Slough are over this way. Uh, this is the Round Tower here. Uh, St George's Chapel is here. The upper ward is here, and this is the area that was affected by the fire. So this photograph here of the fire tenders fighting the fire is in the upper ward and is looking sort of that direction. And this, fire, uh, this photograph taken after the, after the morning after the fire is looking down sort of over there. So we have uh, Chester Tower, we have the Prince of Wales Tower and the Brunswick Tower uh, were all affected. And effectively... Uh, all of these state rooms in this particular area, so the St George's Hall, the Grand Reception Room, the State Dining Room, the Crimson Drawing Room and the Green Drawing Room were all affected by the fire, as was the medieval kitchen. Uh, in all, uh, there were an area of five times the size of the Hampton Court fire was affected by the blaze and 20 times the size of the Upark fire. Uh, perhaps uh, I should just explain that the, the state apartments that were affected by the fire were remodelled for George IV by Geoffrey Wyattville in the 1820s. Uh, the fire started in the private chapel. The private chapel was not one of the most uh, loved parts of the building, uh, and it probably was loved even less after the fire. Uh, and, and it was actually a, a, an unprotected... Sorry. an unprotected halogen light behind these curtains which was left on because the light switch was discreet from the curtain and no one knew that it was on with the, because the curtain was drawn. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And uh, the curtains caught fire and the fire rose up behind the curtains into the roof space above. Uh, so this is before, this is after. Oh, I should just say that some of these photographs I've nicked from... Uh, 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 different sources, but mainly from the uh, uh, from the uh, royal household. So, if there's anyone here from the royal household, please forgive me. The fire spread. So here we are in uh, in the private chapel just here, uh, St George's Hall, and the fire actually started about 11:15 in the morning, and it spread from. Uh, the private chapel into St George's Hall and then northwards towards the medieval, the medieval kitchen here. By 6.30 in the evening it had pretty much uh, 
taken over the whole of this area of the, uh, 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 of the palace. Uh, so the grand reception room, it got, basically got into the roof and it got into the roof of the grand reception room, St. George's Hall. The whole of this accommodation here, which was originally a courtyard, and uh, was effectively sort of fairly mishmash of accommodation related to the kitchen, and then the medieval kitchen. It didn't go any further this way because this is the Waterloo Chamber here, and the Waterloo Chamber had, prior to its being uh, created in, again in the 1840s, was actually an outdoor space, so it was a courtyard, so it actually had a sort of a, an impenetrable wall all the, way, all the way around it. And by 8.30 in the evening, the fire pretty much spread to its full uh, uh, extent, so it had now, by this time, taken over the octagon dining room, the state dining room, the crimson drawing room, and not the green, not the green drawing room, which is this room here, because at this stage, the fire brigade cut a hole in the ceiling of the, of, of, of the green drawing room and poured many, many, many gallons of water through there. Uh, I, I tried to find out how many gallons it was, but at last that journalistic bit uh, eluded me. But it was a lot. Uh, and it also affected the equerry's entrance and the equerry's staircase in here too. Yes, one, 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 one journalistic bit. The, uh, the temperature uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, octagon, in the octagon dining room, uh, the uh, uh, Brunswick Towers, was estimated to reach 820 degrees during the fire. And I remember uh, visiting Windsor about a, about a year after, and the state, the, the state dining room and the Prince of Wales Tower was just like the inside of a blast furnace. It was just completely destroyed. So the aftermath. Uh, I mean, it was pretty devastating. Uh, even, I mean, it was even devastating still a year later when a lot of things had been reinstated. But here we are with the crimson drawing room here, green drawing room there, uh, the state dining room, octagon dining room, St. George's Hall, uh, the, the kitchen court, the uh, uh, grand section room, and the medieval <coughs> kitchen. Uh, this is interesting. One of the, one of the, one of the uh, uh, things that were done, was done by Wyattville and actually Smirk, interestingly enough, Smirk actually put the roof over, designed the roof structure for St. George's Hall. And there were a couple of these trusses that were left in situ uh, because they were, they were not damaged beyond repair. But one of the issues uh, overall is that there was a lot of iron put into the roof structures as well at that stage. And there are iron beams which were pushing the masonry out. Um, uh, maybe that's a lesson for us all there. So, uh, this is just sort of a catalogue, really, of, of the damage. Effectively, the state, the state rooms, uh, St. George's Hall and the Grand Reception Room, have both lost their roofs and ceilings almost entirely, and the walls were uh, desiccated by heat and not helped by water being poured over them afterwards. The private chapel was completely destroyed. The medieval kitchen, the roof was badly damaged. State dining room was completely destroyed, except remnants of the chimney. The octagon dining room, pretty much the same. The crimson drawing room, pretty much uh, crimson drawing room. That should be not crimson dining room. Sorry, uh, it's completely destroyed, except remnants of the chimney piece. The green drawing room had a bloody great hole in the ceiling, uh, but otherwise was pretty much okay. The areas above the state rooms were all totally destroyed, and the areas below the state rooms, of course, were all water damaged. Uh, areas adjacent to the state room, uh, the state rooms were, were fire and water damage, especially the Equus entrance. It, well, well, there was one curiosity: the, the, the glass pantry, which opens off the uh, the state dining room. Uh, uh, the, I, know, I can't remember who went in it the morning after, but they struggled to get the fire door open. It was a pretty hefty fire door. And nothing had been damaged at all. There was no damage whatsoever in the, uh, in the glass pantry. And obviously, God loves a glass. So here we have uh, 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 the, the, uh, the grand reception room, a uh, pile of... Uh, I mean, what, what was interesting, I think, although I wasn't there at the time, is, of course, where ceilings had fallen down in the state rooms and they didn't have any accommodation above. It was just the structures from above. But of course, in the 
crimson drawing room and in the, in, the, in the dining rooms, there was many levels of accommodation. Not only, it wasn't only just the, uh, the ceiling and the floor structure above, but it was all of the, the accommodation above. So there were WC basins, wash hand basins, all sorts of things falling down from the staff accommodation above. Uh, St George's Hall being slightly tidied up. Uh, this is the Equis entrance. Um, it was stabilisation required to uh, areas of masonry where uh, ironwork had pushed the, the uh, 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 destabilised the, the metalwork. The salvage and recording was an exercise that was organised by English Heritage as was, uh, Historic England now. Uh, I, I, and I think that we have to say that uh, I'm going to name check John Thornycroft, who was overall in charge from English Heritage's uh, point of view and had come off the back of the work at Hampton Court Palace. But John was brilliant in, in, in mobilising people. Stephen Brindle, of, uh, uh, who we have with us today, and who is slightly intimidating because he's in the front row and he knows more about this project than I do. So, uh, uh, but but the, 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 uh, the archaeological salvage and recording exercise was incredibly thorough. Uh, uh, the whole of the, uh, all of the state rooms basically were laid out on a grid so that and all of the pieces put into dustbins and then later sorted into trays of different materials. So we had trays of joinery, we had trays of plaster work, we had trays of metal work, and we knew exactly where, from each room, where they came from. And this was done in, as I say, an incredibly uh, 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 well-organised manner. And all ended up, well, pretty much all ended up in what the, used to be the mushroom farm at Windsor. And... Uh, and we were spent many happy hours down there sorting through the uh, uh, the uh, enrichments uh, of different things, looking for bits that we uh, we might be able to reuse or reuse as as as, uh, uh, as models. So, how the decisions were made? There were various committees. I mean, two principal committees set up. Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh chaired the advisory committee, and they were they were there to guide the decision-making process. And there was another committee that the Prince of Wales chaired, which was effectively the Committee of Taste to guide the uh, uh, decisions on design, effectively. Uh, there was also, of course, a massive public debate uh, and opinions varied widely. Uh, there, were, uh, a, a, there were ruinists, uh, as we call them, people who thought that we should just leave the building as ruins, uh, to replicationists, and pretty much every gauge of, of, of restor restoration or not between. And so there was a, it was a, a, a healthy debate, and perhaps actually maybe kind of one of the things that we should be talking about today. There were critical issues which affected the decision-making, First of all, the major works at the time of the fire meant that all the furniture paintings were removed from the staterooms except a Pugin, a senior Pugin, that's Pugin, uh, 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 Augustus Welby, Pugin's father, who was the, who was the, uh, 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 the carpenter joiner cabinet maker to uh, George IV. Uh, and there was a beachy painting that was lost from the state dining, from the state dining room in the fire. But otherwise, the vast majority of the furniture was out of the rooms, carpets, etc., had been made specially for the state rooms for George IV. So we had the suite of rooms, which were the backdrop to an amazing suite of furniture. Uh, there were decisions were made that only minor changes to the roofscape were acceptable. This was uh, a fairly high-level decision uh, that uh, I think was pretty much imposed or suggested by uh, English heritage at the time and was embraced by the royal household. There was a need to, to meet a reasonable programme because, of course, bear in mind that this is the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh's uh, country house, if you like. To, to meet a reasonable programme and budget, there was a need to control the scope of changes. So uh, the early decision was made by the advisory committee that only public areas that could be redesigned were the private chapel and the state dining room. The former did not have a good relationship with St George's Hall, so this was thought to be an opportunity to address 
with, uh, to address this with St George's Hall. Uh, no public spaces such as staff accommodation, oh, sorry, non-public spaces such as staff accommodation could be redesigned and this redesign was guided by the Prince of Wales Committee. The ceiling to St George's Hall was part of the Whiteville scheme, which was agreed might be approved, uh, may, may be uh, uh, altered, because uh, one of the problems with the, 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 the roof and the ceiling of the Whiteville scheme is that it had a very low pitch, and it was thought that a steeper pitch would be much better. In fact, there was a lot of argument about raising the roof to the St George's Hall so that it could accommodate a steeper pitch, but that wasn't allowed because of the earlier decision to uh, only make minor changes to the roofscape. Uh, one of the things to bear in mind, uh, uh, which almost is overriding all of these things, is that this group of state rooms at Windsor is probably the finest suite of Regency room in the, rooms in the UK and represented both a moment in the time stylistically, and it included Louis XV, Louis XVI, uh, 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 and baronial, I mean, even early baronial styles and early Gothic revival styles. And it also was a, a moment in time of changing technology. So a lot of uh, what we saw in the way of construction here was actually quite novel at the time. Uh, and so, I mean, there was already a very strong presumption that we should restore the state rooms because they were such important rooms. Uh, on the on the uh, on your left there is the uh, I mean this is part of the suite of furniture from the crimson drawing room, uh, which was designed for the crimson drawing room. This is a, a, a little pier table designed for the crimson drawing room from the crimson drawing room. There was a and there was a I'd, there was always a a, a need to, or there was a desire not to have a competition for the areas to be redesigned. But there were a group of architects who were invited to produce designs for uh, the state, uh, the, the private chapel and for St George's Hall. It was eventually decided that the state dining room would be restored. And I think this was a, design, this was a, uh, a decision that effectively came out of the Duke of Edinburgh rather than any other, any other position. But, I mean, in a way, it made sense because the state dining room is part of that group of, 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 of regency, build, uh, regency rooms anyway. But anyway, Siddle Gibson, in the, in the guise of Giles Downs, came up with this uh, 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 kind of Gothic revival, a sort of modern interpretation of Gothic uh, interpretation for the uh, private chapel. And... There was a lot of debate about, uh, about whether uh, he should do the private chapel and another architect would do St George's Hall because they preferred the other architect's St George's Hall design. But in the end, it was decided that Siddle Gibson, in the guise of Giles Down, would undertake the, re the, the remodelling of both the private chapel and St George's Hall. Excuse me, sir. But of course, of course, there was quite a, quite a, a lot of water to uh, uh, go under the bridge before we got to that stage. Uh, uh, this this uh, drawing on the top right here shows, uh, this is one of H uh, Hutton and Rostron's drawings showing the areas of, of, of dampness in the building. I mean, they, there was so much water poured into the building. I think, I can't remember, but I got a feeling it was about three years before the one uh, one wall in the green drawing room dried out and there were areas in the basement which were absolutely saturated which meant that we were faced with a dilemma and, and English Heritage were really faced with a dilemma because we were arguing to take off finishes so that we could dry the walls out and English Heritage were arguing well you know they're supposed to be preserving this building uh, but they also wanted to see what was behind the finishes so uh, there was a kind of tension there, which was quite interesting. But uh, there were finishes taken off uh, to allow the drying out. Uh, and, of course, temporary roofs installed. Uh, one of the features of the temporary roofs was they all had roof lights so that you could see what was going on below them. 
uh, which is a, a useful tip if you're ever in that kind of situation. But taking off the finishes, uh, both, uh, both uh, uh, formally and informally, uh, meant that we discovered things. And one of the things that we did discover was the previous scheme uh, that Hugh May uh, had created for Charles II in St. George's Hall. So in the, on the top left there, you have the, the Wyattville design with this slightly unsatisfactory... Uh, well, it's a kind of brownial style, but you know, a little bit watered down. Uh, that had superseded this Baroque uh, Hugh May design. And taking off bits of, of this revealed that quite how much of that Hugh May uh, Vario uh, Gibbons scheme still survived behind the finishes. Anyway, the, uh, the decision was, uh, 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 was, was to carry on and not restore the Baroque interior, uh, which I guess was right because we, we've got a group of, of Regency rooms. Why would we go away from the Regency rooms? So, uh, taking off finishes in the grand reception room, uh, this is the grand reception room, that's the floor level there, that's the, the, the rooms below the grand reception room. Taking off the wall linings where we could in the grand reception room, which was largely the backings to the, uh, the tapestries, and taking off dados uh, where they could be easily removed. We ended up getting a much more, English heritage in particular, ended up getting a much better understanding of the way that the upper ward had been changed over the years with 14th century work for Edward III, 17th century work for Charles II, and of course the early 19th century work for George IV. We also discovered uh, in doing the sort of detailed surveys for the repairs that uh, Wyattville, uh, uh, in, in the guise of Mor Morrill and Seddon, who were the interior decorators that Wyattville had used, uh, had very craftily gone over to France and bought uh, French boiserie panels uh, from France and brought them in to use in the grand reception room. And here you see, uh, from here to that level there, so the floor levels down here, uh, to about two-thirds of the way up to the ceiling, uh, was actually French boiserie panels, and this was all carved wood, uh, and actually, it was all water gilt carved wood as well. I mean, it must have, I mean, it, you can understand why the French had a revolution, really. Uh, <laughs> uh, but above that, uh, to make up the dis the, this sort of this distance between the top of the, the boiserie panelling and the ceiling, it was all done in plaster, really quite crudely. And it had been done in cast plaster largely, taking moulds from the boiserie, the, uh, uh, the 18th century boiserie panelling. Uh, but so we, we made the, we, we found these really interesting uh, different things. But anyway, uh, moving on to the uh, approach to restoration, which I guess is the nub of what we're all here for. Uh, the public arguments, uh, they'd seen uh, ruinists who wanted to see elements of the building left in that ruined state. But that was dismissed because, frankly, it wasn't thought to be practical in a living, working building. Windsor Castle is a living working building, uh, with a living working building as well as being the country home of the Queen or the monarch. Uh, there were people who ended up being called vitalists who argued for the complete redesign of the fire damaged areas and, and redesigned in a modern idiom. And this would have been proven, I mean, this would have been, uh, been very, very difficult given that we got all the furnishings and all the pictures to fit a suite of Regency rooms. Uh, so, it, uh, if, if that had gone ahead, they'd have had no natural home for all of that, uh, uh, that material, and that would have ended up in a museum. So, uh, that was ruled out. And then there were the replicationists, and we can all guess what replicationists wanted. There was an option study carried out, which uh, uh, Donald would be pleased for me to mention. Uh, uh, but the option study looked at three options, and this is, was an option study for the Duke of, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh. Firstly, it was authentic restoration. This was considered to be too expensive and too time-consuming. There was contemporary redesign, which we have all felt would be in inappropriate, uh, 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 given that the furniture, or furniture and the pictures all survived. 
And then there was the equivalent restoration, which is actually the path that we followed. And the equivalent restoration would allow the designs of the ruins to be restored, but employing modern and more expeditious techniques, if necessary, to suit the programme and budget. This was tempered by a caveat, and I like this. I, 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 don't, I didn't actually come up with this phrase, but I do like it. The caveat that modern materials such as GRP were considered too tawdry to contemplate. <laughs> so we were having equivalent conservation, but no tawdry materials. So moving on, Hockley and Dawson were the engineers in, in, in the phase one of the works, uh, which was actually before insoles were involved, as I think I said. And uh, one, of their, uh, uh, one of the things they did was put in the permanent roofs over, the, uh, over St. George's Hall here and over the grand reception room here. The St. George's Hall roof, uh, uh, I think I said, there were a couple of the smirk uh, trusses survived and they are now within that roof. But otherwise, this is an entirely new designed roof structure. It also allowed a little bit of extra uh, height for the ceiling below, so it, was, it wasn't very much, but I think it was a couple of feet or something like that, it wasn't very much. Uh, the grand reception room uh, roof was rebuilt uh, in steel, the, that's obviously in steel, this is, was done in steel as well. Uh, the roof structure is the same form of the, as the previous structure, but all done in steel. So that was the first of the equivalent conservation, that's actually structural engineering even. Uh, one of the things that was really fascinating, uh, moving on to the medieval kitchen. The medieval kitchen looked a bit like this in the 18th century. It's a sort of a contemporary print, rather spectacular. Uh, it looked a bit like this in the 19th century, and after the fire it looked like this. Now, there was there always been an assumption with the medieval kitchen that the roof had been replaced by as part of Wyattville's work because it's got these weird, sort of weird crenellations and iron, iron brackets and things on it. But we actually discovered that it wasn't uh, 19th century at all, but it was actually medieval. And it was either Wyattville or Bloor had covered up the medieval roof structure with bits of wood and bits of iron and stuff to make it look like a Victorian Gothic uh, roof structure. So uh, the structure which is now part of one of the oldest working kitchens in the world uh, was restored. And we have the wonderful Richard Swift, uh, who was at Giffords at the time, to thank for this uh, rather uh, ingenious and uh, inventive way of reinforcing the medieval uh, uh, timbers to allow us to re, uh, re have a re-evaluated roof which actually clearly now is a medieval roof. So, I mean, it was equivalent restoration, but that's pretty good restoration of any type. That's really more of a repair than a restoration, I'd argue, probably. And moving on to uh, looking at different aspects of the, the project and now uh, looking in the first instance about plaster work. In, in the, I think I said, in the grand reception room, we had... Uh, this, is, this is really how the room looked to me when I first went in there. We had bits of the, the, the cove of the ceiling remaining in situ, but basically there was no ceiling left at all. Uh, the, the walls were badly scorched, and we re were required to do a lot of, of conservation work, particularly not so much on the, uh, on the boiserie, because actually the gesso that had been underneath the, 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 water, the water gilding had protected the wood beautifully. I mean, if you want a, an intumescent type finish, cover everything with gesso. Uh, but the plaster had, had perished, and we had to do a lot of consolidation work on that. Where we could salvage bits of the, uh, the cove, we did. Uh, we did a lot of, 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 of not only consolidation, but re-leveling uh, to get the cove right uh, in, the, in the grand reception room. In the crimson drawing room, there wasn't so much left. Uh, this was the only bit of the plaster ceiling that survived the fire. Uh, we decided in the crimson drawing room, because it was such a pathetic little piece, that we'd actually keep it and repair just that corner to be in the form that it was originally. But otherwise, in the crimson drawing room, we used fibrous plaster, and we did very large uh, fibrous plaster cove pieces 
Uh, we had some genius guys working on the fibrous plastic, really, really quite amazing. The, the key guy had actually been in, in cinema, and he was, he was a genius. Otherwise, you saw the trays of, uh, uh, trays of salvage material. Well, here it is being employed. All of these, these ones that look as though they've been soaked in tea are actually their salvage material, which is being used as, uh, as a model to replicate other, uh, other plaster work. Uh, I think I said that this was technologically, it was an interesting period uh, that the rooms at Windsor were created because there was at the time... Uh, the use of, of, of casting plaster became very, very important and almost to the extent that, you know, if you wanted decoration, you just cast as much as you wanted. And this allowed uh, a, a very ebullient and very, uh, 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 very full uh, designs. Uh, but, but at Windsor, it was very cleverly disguised by hand-modelled work. So you'd have a sort of a, a cast rosette there but then the whole thing was sort of uh, uh, drawn together by what was actually very often quite crude uh, modelled work. But from the floor, of course, it looked brilliant. Uh, and it's, uh, so, uh, as I say, uh, the brown stuff's the bits that we reused. Even in the crimson drawing room, we used, reused probably more than we would necessarily have uh, been uh, required to do. In the grand reception room, we used a lot of, uh, of, of, of salvage material. Any handmade salvage material that we had, we reused. Any hand-modelled stuff. In the green drawing room, uh, we didn't do equivalent conservation, uh, equivalent restoration at all. We actually replicated it like for like in exactly the same techniques as it was previously. This was the hole that the fire brigade cut. Uh, the walls been t all of the linings were taken off the walls to get the walls to dry out. But we even used, this was a, a technique called, this is called spike and rope. And this is a sort of a, an, an, uh, uh, an 18th century technique where uh, uh, string is wrapped around uh, spikes uh, into plaster work and then casting plaster built up on it and then so you can run a beam. Uh, I'd, I'd never seen it before. We did it there. And we ran traditional cornices in the green drawing room. Moving on to uh, joinery, uh, again, in the green drawing room, uh, there wasn't too much fire damage in the green drawing room. The green drawing room was a very, very odd panelling because it wasn't actually panelling at all. It was actually faked up. It was in the, the 19th century, it, uh, it was a 19th century fake. So basically, there was, what, if you like, a, a series of framed and ledged uh, panels stacked upon a dado uh, with no particular relationship to where the actual decorative panelling was. And the actual panelling was formed out of thin strips of wood uh, nailed to these, these, these panels uh, uh, which were the backing. Uh, I'd never seen it before. Uh, I didn't like it. But, uh, in the crimson drawing room, curiously enough, the panelling had actually been made in the normal traditional way. And so we restored it in the normal traditional way. But what you can see here is fire stopping between the rooms. Uh, of course, they, uh, they have these big arched openings between the rooms, and we filled them all up. Uh, where we had architectural uh, 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 carved elements, uh, just piecing in repairs, and in the grand reception room, uh, diaper work on the walls, repaired in situ. So again, that was all pretty much repaired, other than, well actually, it was all repaired, even in the crimson drawing room, Joinery, not even equivalent restoration, that is just replicating what had been there previously. And similarly, in a way, in the floors, the uh, grand reception room, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the panelled uh, uh, parquetry uh, uh, Versailles panels were all reused. I can't remember, I've got a feeling we reused the boards as well. The, the green drawing room, that's what the green drawing room floor looked like, that was just cleaned up, polished, uh, repaired, polished up. It was fine. The crimson drawing room floor, which actually was a Victorian replacement, this was from, uh, you probably see a date on there, I can't read it from here, uh, but this was a Victorian floor that was actually quite thin, uh, uh, quite thin veneers, and we had it remade actually in about 15 millimetre thick wood. It was all laser cut, because all of this stuff could be laser cut now, 
and it was all laser cut, and it will last a long, a lot, lot longer than the Victorian one would, would ever have done. One of the biggest challenges of the project was, uh, uh, was replicating composition. A composition is a material which uh, was at its height of popularity from about the late 18th century onwards. The Adam brothers used composition a lot, uh, particularly for small enrichments on ceilings. Uh, Windsor, uh, and very often uh, uh, you'll find composition is used on, on picture frames. Windsor was probably the apotheosis of composition use. Uh, the quality of the designs and the quality of the construction of the composition work here is probably as good as anywhere ever. And we had one person in this country who was actually employed doing composition by Jackson, George Jackson and Sons. And this was really our biggest challenge because he'd never done anything like this. He'd never done, this is actually all made out of different bits of composition. It's put together on a wooden backing, but it's basically all composition. Uh, I mean, even, a, even to do a little sort of mask like this and a bit of, uh, this was a bit of a challenge for him. Compositions, I should have said, is made out of whiting, which is basically chalk, uh, animal glue, and resin. And when it's warm, it's quite, it's a bit like putty, really, uh, but it dries rock hard. And you see, it's formed uh, in a press. You have these hard, these, these, uh, these are moulds, so these are reverse moulds uh, for these panels, and these are actually cast from originals in resin. And uh, uh, Ernie here is sort of demonstrating this hand press, pressing the, the uh, composition into the mold. Well, we didn't have enough time to do everything in composition. So in a way, the challenge was, what should we do in composition? And this is where the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, we did have to use our imaginations a bit. We did not use GRP, because that would have been tawdry. But what we did use uh, was uh, the sort of the central part, the sort of central uh, decorative elements of these, these uh, frames in the crimson drawing room we made in fibrous plaster, in a very, very, very fine fibrous plaster, which we could water gild onto, because this is all water gilt in the end. But otherwise, the green drawing room, uh, 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 green drawing room frames were repaired like for like, and the crimson drawing room frames, all of the external bits, all of these really, really tricky bits, they managed to do for us in the end. And all, as I say, water gilt. And another, another challenge, and this wasn't a, an equivalent restoration either. When the Queen Mother uh, had woken up the day after the fire, she asked what had happened to the door trophies. And this is a set of door trophies, most of which had come from Carlton House, or a large proportion of which had come from Carlton House. Carlton House was being demolished at the time that uh, Windsor was being set up for George IV. And so these trophies were uh, 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 installed on the doors in the state drawing rooms. There are some in the white drawing room, the crimson drawing room, and the green drawing room. And there are effectively about 80 of them. And of the 80, something like 60 of them were, were damaged. Some were destroyed completely. Uh, some have a little bit of damage. Some, quite a few of them were a bit like this. You know, effectively, they were just scraps that people had picked up off the floor. We were very, very, very fortunate that the, 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 the Royal Collection had prior to the fire, actually it's the Royal Household, I'm giving the, the Royal Household prior to the fire had taken full-size photographs of these, these, uh, uh, these things. Otherwise, we would have been totally stuffed. Mm. Uh, uh, but it was actually a bit of a challenge finding carvers to recreate these things. Uh, in the end, we put them out to four different lots of carvers. And the repair process... Uh, was uh, you know, fitting the original bits. So the le that little hat there, which is that little hat there, is put into a fretted out frame and then it's carved in. So the carvers then uh, spend hours and hours and hours replicating the pattern that they've got on the photo full size photograph. Now there were bits that were very charred, they were reincorporated. You know, this, this one literally has only got that, that, and that, and I think a bit there left from the original design. 
Uh, this one is this one is effectively that's all very charred, but it's back in the in the original design. And this is one of the carvers uh, uh, carving it out. And what the biggest challenge for this was these 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 trophies were spread over four different studios, and it was only when we got them all together that. Uh, we could tell whether they were actually going to match because, of course, they had to match uh, because they, um, although these different studios have got sort of a door full, so six, that six lot would be with one studio. All of the gilding in the different rooms have got to match in, for, in terms of colour. And water gilding, water gilding is a process where you can use the same gold, but it depends on the, the, the way that the bowl's applied, what the colour of the bowl is and whatever, uh, to, as to what it ends up looking like. But we got them all in, in, in the one studio, and they, what a, I mean, you would like to take them home, wouldn't you? I know I would. <laughs> so then moving on. Uh, the painting decorating uh, schemes uh, were based on uh, paint research uh, carried out by Helen Hughes. Um, we discovered that all of the rooms actually effectively were the same colour, and there was this warm stone colour that Wyatt Bill liked. Uh, we... Uh, we embarked on a, a regilding program that saw a lot more gold put on uh, than there was prior to the fire, uh, but there was probably less gold than there was in the early 19th century. One of the problems at Windsor is that uh, 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 different uh, sovereigns had had different tastes, and the gilding had actually become watered down a bit over the years. Uh, uh, the, the one area that we didn't paint all the same colour was the grand reception room where I think there was something like five different shades of, of the same colour uh, were applied from the ceiling down to the skirting uh, just to give a sort of a gradation which frankly uh, means that it all looks the same colour. It is quite amazing how five different colours sh gra uh, grading up from dark, fairly dark on the skirting up to the ceiling can all when reading together, read together, all look the same. So moving on to uh, uh, the finishings, mirror plates were a real nightmare. Uh, you can't actually get uh, 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 mercury silvered mirrors anymore. And there was only one uh, studio in the country that we found in Essex where uh, they had a hand. They did hand silvering, which is required to be, and they hand silvered on a table that was big enough to allow us to just put these large mirror plates in the crimson drawing room in, in two pieces. So there's actually a, a line across there where, because that was the biggest sheet of mirror glass that we could produce hand silvered. There was an awful lot of, of uh, water gilding as well as the in situ uh, 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 oil gilding. And then I think we just look at the... the so that's the green drawing room finished. Uh, what I don't have is a finished photograph with the hole. <laughs> the hole is actually above your head here. And so effective, that's just a re redecorated room. But you see, I mean, one of the things that when you see the rooms complete with their, uh, with their soft furnishings, uh, with their, their suites of furniture, with their cabinets, with their, their, their works of art, with their paintings, you can understand why would you not want that? Answers, please, on a postcard. Uh, and the crimson drawing. I always like to say about this photograph that everything in that, everything in that photograph, other than the furniture, is new. And so, uh, but actually, it's equivalent cons equivalent restoration because actually the ceiling is is kind of a fake because it's it's fibrous plaster. But actually, the rest of it is pretty much made in exactly the same way as it was originally. Then the state, uh, so the, the grand reception room, uh, again, uh, uh, the ceiling is re reinstated. Uh, the walls are pretty much just repaired. Uh, the floor's repaired. So, I mean, pretty much it's, it's, it's although equivalent uh, restoration, it is still pretty much what was there before. Then finally, uh, St. George's Hall with the slightly steeper pitched uh, roof ceiling and Giles Downs I, Giles Downs did a I think did a brilliant job on both 
on both St George's Hall and on the chapel as well. The chapel is, is a much better relationship now with St George's Hall. And then further reading, uh, if anyone's not read uh, Adam Nicholson's book on, on the rebuilding of Windsor Castle, it is a very entertaining read. Adam writes beautifully. Uh, and, in, and I'm going to embarrass him now. And secondly, this is the ultimate book on Windsor Castle, uh, which is edited by Stephen Brindle. <laughs> Thank you.